Okay, so we left off uh, last time talking about Frank Lloyd Wright and his uh, modernism, uh, his resurgence of his career really in the 1930s and how that began to inspire uh, modernism in America and this, uh, this work, uh, both that we talked about Falling Water, uh, his own Taliesin West, and we'll talk about two more projects today, including Johnson Wax Company, uh, really helped to inspire and, and push America towards uh, modernism uh, that Europeans had been um, working towards uh, starting in the 1920s. So Johnson Wax Company, which is in Racine, Wisconsin, uh, Wright already had a pre-established relationship with the owner of the company. He had designed a house for him outside of Racine called Wingspread. Uh, but in 1939, or about that time, uh, they, he wanted a new corporate headquarters built in the little town of Racine. And Wright comes up with something pretty radical uh, for, a, for an office complex. Uh, it includes what we see here, the most prominent feature is a research tower, which uh, was where the scientists working for the company uh, did their research, and you can see that right down the middle here. And uh, I'll show you a, a detail of that in a minute. We'll talk a little more about that. But the primary aspect of it is the rest of the building, which is uh, uh, essentially corporate offices. And the most uni uh, unique and unusual feature, perhaps, is the interior space. Uh, this was a large open uh, space for the administrative staff. You can see the original designs of the furniture that he did as well. Uh, and it's based on this grid of columns. These are co you know, uh, poured concrete columns that uh, sort of have this almost mushroom, abstract mushroom design to them. And they are um, actually very reflective of the structural uh, capacity of them. When you, when you have a column, you need to support uh, the sort of wide area up above that. So these disks here at the top are wide and, and relatively thin because they're, they're grabbing the structure of the ceiling and support above that. And as you come down, one of the benefits of cast concrete, it, 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 um, concrete is very strong in compression. Uh, so it can take a, a huge amount of load in compression and concentrate that. And so the reason these columns taper is because they need to be a little wider at the top to support these disks. But down at the bottom, uh, the concrete can concentrate that load almost to a pinpoint. And so Wright designs these columns rather than being rather uniform. Uh, he, he designs them in this geometric form to reflect uh, essentially what they are doing structurally. And it, it was pretty innovative. I mean, Wright, Wright worked with structural engineers as well, but it was, it was still pretty innovative and the building code official in Racine didn't trust this design. They'd never seen anything like this. You know, he was used to, you know, steel beams and, uh, you know, plain old, uh, you know, sections of concrete and so forth. And so uh, they actually created a, a mock-up, a full-scale mock-up uh, of one of these and they supported it and they'd started putting sandbags or something on top, huge load on the top of it uh, until they finally reached the, the design load and the code official said, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm convinced you can, you can build these. Uh, and Wright said, no, let's keep going. So uh, they kept adding more and more weight to the very top and did that uh, until it finally failed. And I think, I don't know, two or three times the amount of load that it needed to support is, is what it could support. So uh, it was kind of a fun little uh, structural innovation. And the other very unique thing about Johnson Wax is the, uh, the skylight and the it's a little hard to see along the perimeter is, uh, is essentially a clear story windows. And he uses a very innovative material for the time, uh, a Pyrex tube. If you, you know, do any cooking in your kitchen and you, you know, Pyrex, you know, uh, baking pan or, uh, or a Pyrex uh, measuring cup or something like that. It's the same, you know, high strength glass material. Uh, but these were, we, these were essentially hollow tubes and he put, bundled them together with a sealant in between to create this translucent um, 
light, and it's it's a very interesting visual effect aesthetically. Um, but he didn't. Uh, he figured that the office people they didn't need to be staring out the windows. They needed light, but they didn't need the distractions of looking out the windows. So he created these Pyrex tubes that you couldn't really see through, but the light would come through. Of course, they leaked. The sealant technology in the 1930s uh, just wasn't up to par, and it was, it's was it been a problem for a long time. Now with more modern you know, 21st century sealants, uh, it, it probably works a lot better, but it uh, certainly was always a, a problem. Uh, just any time you're, you're, an architect is innovative, uh, they're usually going to have challenges and problems that come about because of that. So that's why I say a great architect, uh, buildings has to, the roof has to leak. So here's a floor plan. So the space we were just looking at here is on the right, and you can see all the dots and the little circles above those. Those are representing those columns. And this is a, essentially a big open, uh, what would have been called the secretarial pool at the time. And then the perimeter around the edges and in the mezzanine where, where the corporate offices were. And this, this functionally worked very well. And it's very similar to an earlier project he did, the Larkin Building in Buffalo. We didn't talk about that, but um, the, the overall planning uh, was somewhat similar to that. But it was still very different from the way corporate offices were generally built uh, up to that date. Uh, this area right in here is actually a bit of a carport so um, down on the ground floor so the executives could be pulled up, you know, uh, by their driver right up and underneath uh, a shelter and walk right on into the building. And then their research tower is, is right about here, at least the base of that. There's another detail of those columns. And you can see the Pyrex tubing for the skylight a little bit better. Above that, this is really more of what we would technically call lay light. It's more the decorative element that you see when you're inside. Above that is a more traditional skylight element. But the, um, the perimeter windows, the, the transom windows, or clear story windows, they're, they're the Pyrex tubes, and they also leak. quite a fabulous space. Uh, they, they are open for tours, uh, I think usually on weekends, because it still functions as corporate offices for the uh, Johnson Wax Company. So, um, uh, but you can't go up for tours. Uh, you can go on their website when they're when everything opens back up again, and it's well worth the visit. And then you can also go to Wing Spread, which is the house he designed. So here's uh, the outdoor carport area. Uh, where, where you know people can pull up in their cars and be let out and go directly into the building. You can see continues that structural grid and system uh, on the outside as well. So everything carries through, and this is a hallmark of uh, you know modernism, modernist architecture, is you create something uh, like a, an overarching theme, the structural system that's also aesthetic, and you carry that through the whole project. This is some of the furniture. Uh, the chair on the left is the original chair. And you may notice there are only three legs. Uh, there are, it's on casters, so the secretary could roll around. But uh, this was a, a, not a very stable chair. A, a three-legged stool is it's a bit tough to sit in, especially for a long office day. And Wright's philosophy was that the secretary would have good posture and she would, you know, have to be forced to really, you know, think about how she sat uh, for the duration of the workday. Uh, practically speaking, that wasn't wasn't the best deal in the end. So uh, later the chairs were redone, redone with a traditional four-leg system so you could actually sit comfortably for uh, the duration of the day. But these were a pretty innovative um, uh, furniture designs. He had always done furniture in his in his prairie style houses, uh, and he continued that on well into his later designs as well. And had a furniture line with a with a major manufacturing company for residential furniture. So here's a detail of the research tower. And uh, the idea behind this tower, this was actually added a little bit later after the corporate office was done. Uh, but the idea behind this is that it would focus all of the scientific research into one tower. And the, the tower was designed so that even though it's all vertical and you think, well, if you're on your floor, you're very isolated, you know, and there's somebody on the floor above you and below you and you can't really interact with them. But right 
uh, actually created a system in which uh, the floors are open internally. And you can almost see that when you get just the right light in this photograph, you can actually see the Pyrex tubes. And you can see through that is very faintly are the interior walls of the various levels. And they're circular inside this square um, footprint. And so when you're inside, you can actually look up and look down to the floor above you or the floor below you. And the purpose of that was to have more interactions between the researchers and the scientists, much the same way that, you know, Google or, or you know, any, you know, so, you know, research center today tries to sort of create the opportunities for scientists to mix and mingle so that, you know, you have a more collaborative environment. He also planned this tower. This is one of the first towers he was ever able to build. He, he always wanted to build skyscrapers and all that. He had that plan, wild plan for a mile high skyscraper in Chicago that, of course, was just a fantasy. Uh, but uh, this was one of the first time he gets to do that. And so he was always fascinated with taking the idea of a tree and nature and how, you know, in, interpreting uh, how nature creates something vertical with these horizontal bands like a tree does uh, and interpreting that in, in architecture. So he has a very deep uh, sort of root system that varies down deep to provide the lateral stability up at the top. And then we have a solid trunk in the middle and then these uh, branches come out. And if you look carefully at this section, you can see that each floor level is a little different than the one uh, you know, intermingled. So this is the outside wall right here and right here. And this one you can see is inset just a little bit. And that is one of the circular floors so that when you're standing on this level, you can look down to people that are on the level below you. And you see that better in the construction photograph. It's wrapped in a scaffold, but you can see the mix and match between the square element on the outside and the round circular element on the inside. And a historic uh, photograph of it, uh, again, just in the right lighting, that, that intermix uh, comes out really well. And here's another historic photo showing um, the researchers in there. The elevator was circular. How many people have been on a circular elevator? Not, not too often. Uh, so that was kind of a cool, innovative thing at the time as well. Unfortunately, there was only one elevator and one stair. And so uh, the, the tower was closed for many, many decades. Uh, and it really became uh, obsolete. Uh, the spaces were just simply too small and so forth. And so for a long time, it, it closed down in the late 20th century, closed down for actual research purposes. Uh, and they couldn't even have people in there because uh, they didn't meet fire codes with uh, only one stair and so forth. But now they're able to take very small groups on the tours up into the research tower. Uh, so I was able to do that a couple of years ago. It was pretty cool. It's pretty much intact the way it was. You know, once when the scientists move out, they just moved out. They didn't make too many changes to it. So the other thing he does, starting in uh, uh, 1936 is create a, a whole new residential uh, form of architecture. So, you know, if he had been famous in the early 20th centuries for his prairie school and his innovative ideas about what residential architecture ought to be, uh, he starts over again in the 1930s. You know, some of those lessons about open planning and tying uh, a family and the home to nature and using a, a fireplace, the hearth as the heart of the home, some of those concepts carry on. But obviously, architecture is very different, you know, some 30 years later. And so he creates a series of houses starting in 1936 that he labels Usonian. And the idea is he wants to create a, an American architecture architecture, a truly pure American architecture of residential housing that would be appropriate for the common middle class family. So these were meant to be relatively lower cost houses, not for the rich and famous, which were most of his early clients, although he had always had an idea of you know, creating affordable housing for people. Uh, he just never was able to really make it work 
practically speaking. And he tries this again, and and uh, you know it, it's a little more successful from the standpoint of being affordable for middle class families, but it's still not you know what we would consider affordable housing. And often wealthier families would still hire them, and they'd create these you know grandiose homes in this style. But this Usonian house idea was meant to be, you know, his answer to what modern architecture ought to be. And it's, again, a part of that challenge he felt from the MoMA exhibition of 1932, which was really promoting modernist European architecture. And Wright felt that Americans could create their own vision of what modern architecture ought to be. And he's one of the first to really say, here's, you know, here's what this could be. This could represent American ideals and American values and so forth. And the first, what we would consider Usonian house is the Jacobs house in just outside of Madison, Wisconsin uh, from 1936. And these were, you know, a progressive family and they turned to right. They probably saw, you know, uh, heard about his uh, falling water and so forth and said, hey, build us a house too. And so uh, we get a relatively small, more compact house that is appropriate for you know the average suburban middle class family that's very much a suburban style of house it's still fairly low and and wide spread across of the landscape he would usually site the house at one side of the property so that it could open up uh, a much broader lawn or garden area uh, usually off the back and it would sort of flip the traditional suburban model where you have this big front yard uh, that you know is sort of wasted because people don't hang out in their front yard it's not very private. And so he would push the house as close as he could to the street and he would have a giant backyard that was much more private, surrounded by privacy fences and so forth. And you can see that the main living space here uh, is filled with a glass wall that allows that connection between nature and people on the inside. You can close it off when you need to, but on a nice day, you can throw open those French doors and you can have lots of ventilation. And of course, you always have a visual connection to the outside natural world. Uh, he uses a lot of uh, brick and a lot of uh, wood, but he turns the wood, you can see it real well, right here sort of in the middle under this bay window uh, he turns that horizontal and he creates kind of a horizontal board and batten system almost that um, uh, is is usually a lesser quality where like you know a pine or, or fir or something like that it's not meant to be like finished oak or something that he was uh, well known for in the prairie school so here's a, a floor plan of it and these are pretty typical of the usonian floor plans in this case it's on a rectangular grid system, he would often play with triangles and circles as well. And some of the funkier houses are based on a triangular or hexagonal grid, uh, which is not an easy one to, to plan out walls and so forth. But he, like before, he's breaking down the interiors. He's got a large living space that's essentially physically and visually connected to the dining area. Even the kitchen is now more open. It's it's not quite the big open, you know, grand universal space that we are more used to in houses today. But, you know, that there's no wall separating the kitchen from the dining area. And that's because no longer do people, and certainly not middle class people, have kitchen servants. You know, they they the, the housewife is at this time is the one doing the cooking and you know she as as the matron of the family she does you know we're not going to separate her off in a little room with a door on it uh so the kitchen is now becoming more part of the living space and it will progress even further both in Wright's usonian houses but in overall residential planning and then there's a wing. Um, it's This is not a pinwheel design that his prairie houses were based on, but he doesn't just do a rectangular box. So he spreads these wings out uh, for bedrooms and other spaces. And on the, you know, they all open up onto this back courtyard area uh, to get the best light and the best view. And then, you know, the areas along the side of the property or up at the front or something is just a simple wall, maybe with a with a clear story window. Typically with a carport, uh, even in more northern climates, he would do a carport rather than a full-on garage. It's a little cheaper. 
Um, that helps keep the cost down. He would do concrete slab on grade. There would be no basements in these houses. And he would put uh, radiant floor heating into the concrete uh, so that you didn't have big old clunky radiators taking up space or, you know, they didn't have the most efficient, you know, forced air system back in the day. So the, the whole concrete floor would warm up and that would provide the radiant heat in winter. Uh, 50 years on now, many of those are failing and it's, it's quite an effort to rip up the concrete and redo the radiant floor system uh, if you're trying to restore the houses. But um, it was a pretty innovative system at the time and it's a nice kind of heat as well. Here's a view of the interior space, uh, a lot of built-ins. Uh, these were often built, they're, they're pretty small houses, or at least the, the ones for more ordinary families. And so they're often built like ships, like ship in, or boat interiors. So lots of built-ins, lots of woodwork. Uh, the, the ceiling is this same sort of uh, board and batten or shiplap type siding. Just using simple pine, you can see the knots in the wood here. So it's a it's a cheaper wood than the, the quarter sawn oak that was more typical of the Prairie School era. And you can even see some of the more modern furniture in here. Uh, I think this desk back here is a Wright designed piece that it's not unusual for Wright to have designed uh, the furniture often in this sort of hexagonal or triangular shape and so forth. If, if the house matched that grid, he would match that with the furniture. And the last project for Wright I want to talk about is the Guggenheim uh, in New York. So this is in the post-World War II period. His career takes off in the mid to late 30s. Um, it's a little set back, of course, by World War II, uh, but he you know, gets through that. And then in the post-war construction boom and economic boom of the 1950s, Wright's career is probably bigger than it ever had been. Uh, he's, he's just super busy. Uh, he's got plenty of work to keep his Taliesin fellows busy and doing Usonian houses and doing commercial projects and college campuses and so forth. But his most, probably his most famous, one of his most important works is the Guggenheim Museum from 1956. So Guggenheim was a very, very wealthy, um, matroness art collector and wanted to create a, you know a series of museums and uh, hired wanted to sort of break out of the traditional museum mode I mean this I think from the get-go uh, Peggy Guggenheim who was the client she wanted something she wanted a museum that was almost an, a piece of architecture in and of itself and we're going to see other examples or at least one other example in a future lecture of this tradition carried on, but Frank Lloyd Wright is really the first to do it with her. And so we have a museum that becomes a work of art, a work of sculpture in and of itself. Uh, Wright creates he, uh, something very radical for the site, which is um, right on Fifth Avenue uh, across, from, uh, across from Central Park and lined with these, you know, blocks of, you know, high rises. And he introduces on this grid plan of New York a bunch of circles and a low slung, uh, low rise uh, building that is in direct contest, contrast to the, the verticality and the orthogonal nature of New, you know, Manhattan, New York City. Uh, the wing here, you see this big old wall in the back here. This is a later addition from the uh, late 20th century. It was actually pretty controversial. Some people think it makes it look like a toilet bowl. But uh, the original is the spiral uh, portion here. And then just on the left is the sort of executive wing uh, with an entrance area down here. This is all uh, cast in place concrete. Uh, so kind of almost we started uh, almost with the cast in place concrete of Unity Temple, which was a radical uh, change of what a church ought to be, very insular. Uh, this is and very different from the sort of architecture of, of Oak Park at the time. And he ends, this is one of his last buildings of his career, he ends with a can concrete build that is, you know, com a complete radical break of what museum design ought to be. So the idea with the spiral that you see here, and I think I have a detail of it. The idea of the spiral is, is he creates a passageway for visitors to experience the art. 
And so the idea is you would enter, let's go back, you would enter at the ground level. You actually have to go down a little bit below street level to enter into the building. Uh, the main floor is recessed a bit below the sidewalk level. You would then immediately, after you get your ticket or whatever, you would immediately enter an elevator and you would rise, you know, ride the elevator up to the top floor. So it would be somewhere up here. And then you would walk down the spiral, circling again and again and again until you eventually made it back down to that ground floor again. And all the while along the perimeter walls of the spiral would be hang the artwork. And here is a historic view of that. Once you get to the top, you come out on this open atrium space uh, and you can see the spiral is on the interior as well as the exterior. This is, you know, a true expression. The exterior is a true expression of the, of the design and the functionality of the interior. And the idea is that as you walk around down these ramps, it's easy. You're not trying to go up and you're not getting lost, right? Felt that, you know, when you went in a typical museum, divided with all these gallery spaces, these little rooms, uh, you, you'd get lost. And, it's, and it, it is a challenge for museum planners to, to have a pathway for people to follow in a relatively methodical manner. And Wright said, well, I'm not going to give you a choice. You just walk down the spiral and you go down and down and down. You don't turn. You don't go th into this room or that room. You just keep going down and down and you always know where you are. And so in a way, it's a very creative, innovative approach. Uh, functionally speaking, there, it, there is a major challenge that the museum is often faced, which is that uh, because the museum is on a spiral, you're, you're literally going down a ramp, none of the walls are quite level and even. And so you're trying to put a square painting in a trapezoid type wall space. Uh, it's always been a challenge, you know, not only the, the space is trapezoid, but the wall itself is curved because the whole thing is a circle. Uh, so it's always a challenge. Uh, and if you try to put a piece of sculpture, right, you know, you can't just put it on a standard base. The base has to have a slope to it. So it's so the base is flat, but the bottom of it, you know, actually fits to the uh, ramp uh, angle of the floor. But it is a very cool space to be in. Here's a looking up at the skylight. So this is at nighttime, but during the day, you would get plenty of light coming in from the top, but there are no walls around the perimeter, which is pretty standard in a museum. You don't want too much natural light coming into the museum. And a view of my uh, my model, Melissa, my wife there. This is uh, our one chance we got to go in the museum, but unfortunately they were between exhibitions, but you do get a glimpse of uh, how the uh, spaces work around the perimeter and, and, you know, the challenge of trying to put an art piece of artwork or more in these uh, little gallery areas because the wall is curved and the, the whole space is on, a, on an angle. All right, so that ends, uh, pretty much ends Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, he dies in 1959, uh, just about the time that the museum is, is uh, concluding, but his legacy lives on for sure, and we'll, we'll, we'll see that a little bit as we continue on, but certainly the people he trained at Taliesin continue this style of architecture and this approach to modernism that Wright had, had 